I'm Divagar Tantravayi, <coughs> co-founder and the CEO at InnoMind Software, and Arsen from PAR, and Elizabeth from uh, BMC Software, Serious VP Technology and CTO, and the George M. Last Line is the VP Engineering. <laughs> Excited to be here. We have seen the earlier on the AI side. The topic that we want to see is how the product strategy in this context. And uh, one of the things that we did at InnoMind's really helping innovators stay ahead in the game. We are doing it for the last 10 years. Personally, myself, build the products, helping innovators to build the products. And then I started looking at what is the kind of an angle, the transition happening last 10 years, and where we were really land at. And the thought I took is a more a human metaphor, if you will. So we have seen in the past how the human computer interaction has been. It's primarily driven by a browser or the desktop, and the humans typing at mouse clicks at us. So how that is changing. And we have seen in the industrial age how the assembly lines and the productivity has been improved, and how we took in the technology age, and then how we did the automation piece of it. And if we really look at the artificial intelligence, what is the first shot we took at it? Uh, it's a primarily looking at the reptilian brain, or how we kind of automated the repeated piece of it. And an interesting thing to see is how we get to the next level and what that imagination can be. But the topic for the day on the panel today is to really look at what are the products that we are building, how it has an implication for that. And the first thing that I want to learn, uh, pick up is primarily the voice as an interaction mechanism or how the UX is really changing, how the interaction <laughs> I don't know if cell phone's causing any problem. I, I can cut that off. So how the interactions are really changing that, right? So that can be one way to really look at that in the paradigm and how the voice has been the prime. And then what are the other interaction models are? Certainly we have seen how the Alexa, the Alexa of the world are coming in and how we got the barrier of the a kid, 10-year kid really talking to Alexa and accomplish something. And if you ask, okay, I need a hatch mail, then it's landing next to your door next day. So that is a kind of interaction model that came in. And if you really look at from an enterprise standpoint, how the customer support kind of systems are really changing. It. So these are the interesting things to really look at that. So I want to start with uh, Elizabeth first in terms of how she sees how the voice is as one of the prime or anything else as an interaction mechanism that is coming in and making a change in the systems and software you're building, or what are the product features you really look at, and what is the prime for that? Yeah, I think a voice is definitely uh, very, very important, because uh, let's see our life. You mentioned that when you're driving to, uh, into work, uh, then you can say, call grandma, pick up the kids, and then they'll you know, call grandma. And then that helps a great deal because I have, uh, I'm the first Chinese woman who owned Tesla Model S. So, so I, I can assure you that that's extremely helpful. But if you look at our product lines, in the last few years, the OCR technology and also the voice really free up people's hand. And we eliminated a lot, a lot of uh, data input. So you, don't, you no longer use your hand to really input data. And um, we have our software called MIT. You basically can use voice. And then a lot of voice input can be used in many other product lines, right? OCR, you know, with the data input. And uh, what I see is uh, if a product at this point does not use the voice, does not use the OCR technology, you're pretty much considered as a dinosaur. There's, there's no other things, right? So that's one thing that you got to do that, and you got to use that in a way that people do not need a keyboard. But the other interesting thing we have seen in the Super Bowl ad, right, what Google Home did, and what it did the Google Home devices that got activated without a reason, right? Yep. So how do you see, are we prime uh, Arzen, or what do you think the technology improvements are? How do you think it's going? Um, so I, I think the, the voice interface is just, you know, what we see at the, at the surface, there's a whole ocean behind that, right? So 
Uh, the voice interfaces has been there for, uh, for a long time. My, my over 10 year old car, you know, has a voice interface. I never use it because the system behind it, uh, you know, what, what that voice interface allows me interface to is a very dumb system. It doesn't understand me, you know, it, 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 it only allows me to speak in a very, uh, you know, structured way that is very, uh, in, you know, unnatural for me. I need to remember how to say things for it to be able to, to, to understand. So uh, we are seeing uh, systems that are getting better on understanding more freeform speech and getting, getting more intelligent, but I think we are still not there, right? So, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an owner of, of uh, Alexa. We actually have few. My five-year-old can, can easily ask for a song and then get it to play. Uh, we cannot cheat her anymore saying that I'm coming in five minutes because she goes and says, you know, Alexa set timer for five minutes and now, <laughs> you, can, you know, you have to, you have to pay attention. Uh, but that said, even, even uh, companies like Google and Alexa, when, when you look at their technologies, you can ask Alexa a question, who is uh, US president? It would answer, it's Trump. And when you ask a follow-up question, like you're holding a conversation with a human being saying, you know, what's his wife's name? then it would not understand because it cannot carry right. context over a conversation. It's not there uh, to be a conversational agent. It is just a voice interface to a question answer system, right? Uh, similarly, you know, a lot of the systems kind of repeat what they understand to verify. You know, you say something and then, and then it asks, you know, you really wanted to do this, right? And then you have to say yes, which is very unnatural for us. In, in, in our conversations, we usually, if I say, you know, I got a new iPhone, and if you did not hear the iPhone word, in your next question, you say, you know, are you happy with your iPhone? And then, you know, you basically test whether you heard the, the, the word correctly. So the, all those systems are not capable of doing that, right? Integrating the verification and checking of what it is understanding to a conversational flow. Um, but I think we are getting there. Uh, voice uh, recognition is, is, is getting significantly better uh, thanks to startups like we heard uh, from some of them as well as large companies like Google and, and, and Apple uh, collecting tremendous amount of data and making those systems uh, you know, much better at understanding. And there's a lot of work going on in, in AI and artificial intelligence to make the, the systems behind those smarter. I think we are getting there. I, they even start to understand uh, me with my, with my harsh accent. So I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting happier, but still not there. I, you know, I don't know how many of you, I'm sure a lot of you have cars that has voice, interf voice interfaces. You know, uh, raise your hands if you're using it you know, every day for, for, for a lot of the functions. I do. Right, so two yeah. people probably they have Teslas because they are a little better than the, the average car. You know, a lot of th the times it's a lot easier for me to get the phone or, or, or you know, just uh, reach out to the, to the stereo. So uh, we still need a lot of improvement in the technology where the, the VX is our main uh, interface to, to technology and only in limited scenarios. You know, you, you, we cannot have in an enterprise environment everyone talking to their computer, it's just, it's, it's, you know, that office environment is not pleasant anymore. So we need to understand that voice comes also with uh, certain problems uh, and it's not the appropriate interface in every context. Thank you. So George, what do you think the product manager should really consider voice as one of the features they need to build in or what do yeah, you think? Yeah, so, so I, I think Hasman hit, hit on a couple of interesting things. One is the conversation. It's, it's, it's less of the actual technology used, whether it's voice or or, or you know, classic UI or machine-to-machine -machine communication, but it's the conversation around the problem that's trying to be solved. And I think if you think of product strategy in, in an age of disruptors, so so how do you make your product less disruptable? I mean, I, I guess, I mean, I guess, I guess everybody's everything is um, going to be disrupted if you're creating any value. If you, I guess if you build something valueless, maybe you won't be disrupted, but everybody else is going to get disrupted sooner or later. So the question is, how do you get longevity out of your product? Um, uh, what we do. At last line is we, we run everything through APIs. So our APIs uh, form the basis for the conversation that we want to have with our 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 interactors, our actors, whether they're human or other machines. Um, we build a UI on top of that. We could also build a voice interface on top of that if we chose. Although I'm not sure how interesting it would be, but I think 
it, the, the, um, you hit on the, two, the, the main point. It's what's the conversation that your product is delivering and then build it in an abstracted way that you won't just get disrupted by the next available interface that comes along that you can, mm -hmm. you can uh, uh, extend it. Thank you. I want to add one point out, boys. Uh, I do use WeChat. I don't know how many people use WeChat here. You know, you do, okay, perfect. So I, well, definitely I speak better Chinese than my English. So I forgot a lot of the Chinese phrase. But when I turn on the voice uh, input, and then the, the system prompts back much proper, you know, much sophisticated Chinese. So actually the voice input helped me to get back to my Chinese, make my Chinese writing more sophisticated. So this is a, a very interesting. It's not only free up my hand, also really uh, bring my language level to the next level. Great. So I want to switch to the next topic before I do that. At least there is a solution to really free up hands. And the, one of the problems we have is the proper tenor. At least there is a solution that we can use less of our hands and the other medium, like a voice, or some interactions to really interact with com uh, computers. But the interesting thing is when you really move to the next level, Probably this is about where there's more a machine to machine or a less of an interaction or a no interaction, if you will. Probably that's an interesting wall. So if you really look at the automation, we are familiar with the assembly lines and how we change the industrial revolution and the productive. And it's easy for us in the new world to really replace that human muscle uh, by the robot. And that's the way the analogy I see it, that the body is coming back under control. We don't need to really work hard to earn our bread, if you will. So that is the next generation of the automation piece. And that's where the machine machine comes in. But if you really look at one hour ago, and then certainly there are <coughs> automation, like ATM is an example. It's a clearly an automation that we all welcome. And we don't know how we can uh, live without an uh, ATM in these days. But it is even taking to the next level where there is a branchless banks. Or it is going to the next level where probably currentless banks. So that's the kind of the Thing that the automation is taking us. But if you again look at some of the engineering aspects of it, how we are doing our software development, and primarily we looked at the QA as a function, which is a repeated function, and it's easy for say, hey, why don't we automate that? And similarly, if you really look at the operational aspect of it, like a DevOps, and we figure out, hey, we need to figure out a solution to that. So in my view, there is a really a product feature where we need to look at, say, what is the repetitive function, make that itself a product, or if you're really looking at something and say, this will really, really help to solve the repetitive problem. Okay. Thank you. So then the question is how we can uh, look at the automation piece of it and look at how we can change the repetitive aspects of it. So that's where we are at an industry. But I'd like to start with Arsene and see what are the choices that we have, both for building the products, building the features in the product, or the product itself is an automation product. Go ahead. Um, so part does not make products, right? So a lot of you might, uh, might know Xerox Park. So we, we, we develop technologies, and we partner with uh, a lot of Fortune 500 companies to to you know, get automation, artificial intelligence, and a lot of uh, other cutting edge technologies into their products to differentiate them in the market. A lot of the, the Fortune 500, and some startups are our, our, our customers, we provide R&D as a service. Uh, and when doing that, we obviously need to understand uh, the, the product strategy. And what we have been seeing is automation of repetitive tasks is always welcome by the by the user and you know companies that are resisting not automating those repetitive tasks in their products are actually losing the customer because someone comes in and automates and disrupt what is what is a lot more trickier especially from the product strategy point of view is uh, if it is not a repetitive task right if, if it requires uh, understanding the context and interpreting and making an autonomous decision based on the con context and, and, and complex set of parameters, uh, when you just automate it, there is, there is a challenge to get that product accepted by the users because a lot of the times they do not understand what, based on what information that, that, that product made that decision, right? 
And in some other areas where, uh, where you're automating someone, so, you know, for example, in manufacturing, we, re we recently got a product, you know, uh, technology uh, out. It is automating process planning in, 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 in subtractive machining. And that is considered one of the hardest problems. It requires a lot of domain knowledge and years of experience for a machinist to be able to envision the process plan uh, you know, by using 500 different uh, machines and, and over 30, 40,000 different tools, as well as unlimited number of, you know, uh, 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 directions that they can approach that part and then they start removing the material. There's also process parameters like the speeds and feeds. So when you go and say, we just automated that, you know, the first reaction you get is, you know, we don't believe you. The second is, you know, when, when you say we created this process plan, there's more than one correct answer in many cases. And if you do, in, do not immediately hit what they were thinking, they just say, no, it's wrong. I wouldn't do that that way. They do not even willing to accept that, you know, there is another way of doing that. And they feel threatened by the, the fact that, you know, what they consider their, their value add to this world is being, being taken away. So, uh, when we are automating things, especially those complex, uh, uh, you know, decision-making systems, what we try to do as the strategy is first semi-automate the system and provide the right interface to the human, where human is still understanding what the device is doing, and then feels in control. Then, when, once that system is adopted and everyone is using that, there is enough trust built in, then you can go to full automation. But when you try to go full automation, you're taking a lot of risk in your product strategy because you might just get the resistance, uh, especially in a safety critical or mission critical jobs. Or, you know, as I said, if you're, if you're taking someone's, you know, value add to this world away, by automating that. So it's, that's it's, something. It's a more question as how much you do it or when you do the automation. Exactly. Okay. So, George, you're really building a product which is basically an automation product. Yeah, I think you know automation is very important for us uh, in, in many ways. Uh, there's you know in just getting product to market, so we, we have to turn around very rapidly at times. If, if um, so, so we we do cybersecurity and, and most specifically detection of of malware. So if new if a new malware strain or something shows up, we need to be able to respond very quickly. Um, QA can be automated to a large extent. And we talked about that earlier. We only have a couple of QA engineers on our, on our whole staff. And it turns out um, the hard part about automating QA is not running the test. It's the interpretation of the results, especially if the results are rich. And that turns into almost an AI-like problem. And you know, for a small company, it's not really, you know, we don't have the techniques or the tools available uh, commercially yet or publicly to be able to figure out how to, to reason over QA results. Um, the actual running of it obviously is, is automation and that needs to be done and we do it and we always need to do more because there's new test cases every, every day. Uh, in terms of, you, you know, sort of, um, so our QA ratio, you know, the, uh, Pari earlier today showed some QA ratios on, on, on cyber uh, crime tech uh, companies and ours is, run, I think we're about 20 to one now. I think we have about 20 engineers per QA engineer. So we run very, very, very lean on that. So you know, there, there's one level of automation. In, in terms, you know, to take it up to a complete, uh, much higher level, as, as you were starting to talk about the, uh, you know, the job displacement. I saw what I thought was an absolutely fascinating event um, last summer. It was the DARPA, DARPA uh, Cyber Grand Challenge. Everybody know what DARPA is or who DARPA is? Yeah, right. The people that brought you the internet before the politician did. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, I, don't, if, I don't know if anybody saw this, but basically they had what was it, maybe seven computers out there. They were big computers. It was it was staged like a a, um, a sports event with jumbotrons, and the idea was that these teams had built up these computers and the software, and when the game the game started, that all the people need to sort of step back, and the machines would operate automatically uh, for you know for the period of the event. And they were charged with effectively attacking each other, finding vulnerabilities in the other's operating systems, patching, uh, detecting that they were, um, uh, well, ideally pat, um, um, attacking and then infiltrating and taking over control of the other computer. 
Um, but on the defensive side, they needed to, to detect that they were being attacked. Then they needed to patch themselves, and they needed to detect that they were being detected on the other side and come up with an alternative attack. So this, this went on for hours you know, at, at high speed. And so, so I'm sitting there watching this thinking, OK, well, this is, this is all very interesting from a, a security perspective. But what's it mean from a job perspective? Um, earlier today, uh, MK suggested that we think about, I'm sorry, MR suggested we think about what's happening to uh, people that are being displaced in other parts of the world, not Silicon Valley. But, but after seeing that, I would posit that a third of the people, two thirds of the people maybe in this room won't have, will be displaced by automation uh -huh. if what I saw comes to fruition. And by the way, what I, what, I, what I did see at this DARPA challenge, you know, five, 10 years ago, they were working on automated vehicles. And we are on the cusp of having automated vehicles. Before that, they worked on the internet. We have the internet. So if, if, if history is an indicator, um, the job displacement is not just in, uh, in the steel industry and then coal industry, but it is in this room. Yeah. yeah. I want so, Elizabeth, yeah, you want I'd like to uh, uh, talk a few things. So, let's uh, focus on software development, right? Before you automate everything, you need to look at your user. So, I took my team to uh, Stanford the Design School, D School, and they have the design thinking. If you haven't done that, I strongly suggest you to to go to Stanford D School and take a tour and then look at our website. The thinking is you want to automate anything, you want to provide an intuitive uh, user interface, you need to understand user's needs.